The main message I want to land today is, is in support of what Eleanor and uh, Gary have said, that two things and two things only should you really hang on to. First is that this is, our qualification is about the investment management industry, all right? So don't get confused, don't think we're an MBA, don't think we're about investment banking uh, or insurance or anything like that. Investment management, that's what this is about. Do not sit this exam if you are not interested in investment management. Please, don't want your money. We are a not-for-profit organization. Uh, if you're interested in investment management, even if you don't intend to become an investment manager, but if you are interested in investment management, this is the credential for you. You'll learn a huge amount, uh, and as Gary said, that will stay with you throughout your career uh, and be very uh, beneficial to you. So that's, uh, you know, that's the first message I want to land. The second is, please don't do this credential if you don't understand what becoming a professional is, and that's what's on the board, our mission statement. Uh, um, what we're about at the, investment, uh, at the uh, CFA Institute is to qualify people to participate in an investment profession. And a profession is there, those last six words, for the ultimate benefit of society. It's to help society first and foremost, to help uh, direct investment to where it's needed, uh, infrastructure spending, we've just been caught in a traffic jam out there and Eleanor was showing us pictures of that road that we just traveled on under sort of three foot of water when it, when it rains here uh, in uh, Nairobi. Um, uh, getting money to where it's needed to build roads, rail, airports, uh, hospitals, education is what we do and that's why we say for the ultimate benefit of society. There's a purpose to investment management and that purpose is not to enrich ourselves, it's to enrich the communities in which we live and work. And through that, yes, we should all have great careers that sustain us for the rest of our lives. And yes, make us uh, a reasonable uh, good living. But that's not the purpose. If you go into investment management just solely from a selfish perspective, you will not succeed. Client is king. Always place your client's interests above all others. So those are the two main messages. We're in the investment management world and we're a professional body. The credential is the start of the journey. Once you have qualified as a CFA, then uh, you enter into the local society that Eleanor runs, uh, and you become a professional member of that society, and you work towards improving standards uh, here in uh, the community in East Africa and in Kenya. These are just some numbers so you know what we're about. We have about um, 280,000 students at any one point in time. Roughly, that's 140,000 at level one, uh, and then uh, about 100,000 at level two, and about 50,000 at level three at any one point in time. So that's roughly, uh, roughly the way it goes. But most of our members still are in North America. Um, uh, uh, EMEA and Asia Pac are catching up. EMEA is larger than Asia, Asia Pac. Uh, and uh, I think, as Gary said, Africa, when you think about it, when you think about what we're doing at the Institute, which is selling um, a credential to young aspirant people who want to join into the investment management world, then Africa, which is going to have the lion's share of the world's youth in the next generation, Africa is for us uh, the most exciting market that we face. Today, China is our biggest market, but Africa as a collection uh, of countries will, be, will outstrip China, I'm quite sure, uh, at some point in the next 20 years. This is my diversity slide. Um, this is the first exam ever sat in 1963 uh, in America. Uh, it was uh, then, you had to be 38 to sit the exam. That's no longer the case. You can sit level one while you're still at university. What we're trying to do uh, is to have a curriculum that reflects, this is a rather a busy slide, but basically the point of the slide is to say that today the investment management industry is undergoing a huge amount of change and our curriculum is always trying to keep up with that and we're trying constantly to attach what we do to this bottom scenario really. There are many different ways in which this industry can develop but the way that we are trying to push this industry towards is what we call purposeful capitalism, i.e. capitalism 
that has a point to it, and that point being how we can float all boats in society. The challenge that we have globally, this may not resonate here in Kenya, but it certainly does uh, globally. The challenge that we have globally is that financial services professionals are not very trusted. Why are they not very trusted? Because their incentivization has been incorrect over the last 20 or 30 years particularly. Um, we have a very poor reputation for helping ourselves and overcharging our clients. Uh, and a lot of the people in the financial services industry actually don't have the right qualifications. So trust levels in what we do is very low, and what we are geared towards at the Institute through our local society here in East Africa is trying to raise those levels of trust through this idea of increasing professionalism in the markets that we serve. And this is a little equation um, to, uh, to help you um, uh, imagine that, that credibility plus professionalism equals trust and value, and that credibility comes through uh, licensing from the Capital Markets Authority uh, or from other entities in the country through the track record and experience that you build up, but also through competency, which is shown by your credential and your qualifications. So we divide our world into three simple buckets. The first one is the one that we're talking to you here about today, which is the credentialing work that's delivering future professionals. But once we've done that, once you qualify to the CFA, uh, then what Eleanor does through the society here is the most important activity. Um, and that, at its apex of a pyramid, is continuing professional education. And then underneath that, career development, uh, community, helping people network, uh, and also brand building are the next three most important things. So once you've qualified, you join the local society here in Nairobi, and we work hard through Eleanor to resource Eleanor, to equip Eleanor to deliver those four things to you. Continuing professional education, community, brand building, um, and career development. Very, very important. Uh, continuing professional education is perhaps the most important of them all. Again, if you think about professions that you know, uh, a doctor, for instance, if you went to see your doctor and she told you that she had never opened a medical textbook from the time that she was 25 to when she's sort of 55, you'd be absolutely horrified. Continuing education for a professional is the most serious responsibility that you must undertake. Because just having that credential hanging on your wall is not enough. It's how you develop your career over the 30 years that you'll have uh, in front of you, how you extend your knowledge that's absolutely vital. And our mechanism for delivering that continuing professional education to you is our local society here in East Africa. So we have these three programs, um, uh, CFA program, which is the main one, uh, but we also have two others uh, on the uh, far right as you look at it, the Investment Foundations Program, which is really for all of the support staff uh, in a fund management business. So if you think about it, probably only 10% of an investment management business has the CFA credential or needs the CFA credential. Um, only about 10% of staff actually touch client money, run client money, or run um, uh, or run the sales side of the organization or the risk management side of the organization where the CFA credential is absolutely vital. It's that sort of job that the credential is for. Portfolio management, stock analysts, um, uh, risk managers, um, sales people perhaps, uh, all of those functions are the ones that typically try to get the charter. But in any business there are about 90% of the rest of the workforce who's also engaged in delivering the product to the end client. And they too need education, and that's where investment foundations come in, CFA Institute Investment Foundations. It's a much lighter course. It is, as its, as its title suggests, a foundation course, uh, only 80 hours of study as opposed to the 300 hours of study that we estimate you need to do at each level of CFA. So 300 hours at level one, 300 hours at level two, 300 hours at level three. Um, so that's the sort of commitment that the CFA um, uh, program demands of you that Gary spoke about. CIPM, the middle qualification there, is a qualification for people who are interested in investment performance analysis. So that's what that one does. 
Uh, it's a sort of halfway, if you like, which is why it's positioned in the middle in terms of degree of difficulty and effort uh, in between uh, the CFA program and investment foundations. So this rather jazzy uh, graphic tries to set out um, the way that the curriculum is structured. So level one is really tools. Uh, level two is about much more about asset classes. And level three puts it all together in terms of portfolio management. So level one offered in December and June every year. Levels two and three offered only in June every year. So you can do it um, December, the following June, and the following June after that. And there are people out there who've nailed this in a year and a half, uh, but they tend to be divorced, um, not have much of a social life, um, and are a little bit odd, frankly. So typically, typically you try and do this over three years. Uh, that's what we recommend. Um, and more importantly than that, uh, Gary actually speaks very well about this, um, that what we're really trying to do is level one, yes, you can take while you're a un at university, while you're an undergraduate. But we'd really rather you didn't take levels two and three until you had a job. Because levels two and three will resonate much more with you if you're actually out there in an investment management business. You can take them after you come down from university, and plenty of people do. But it's much better. The education sinks in much more. It means much more to you. It's much more valuable to you. You can synthesize it much more if you do levels two and three once you've got a job. So we, we encourage employers to say, you know, if, if a graduate has got level one, take them on, hire them, start training them in practical um, uh, uh, investment management disciplines. And whilst you're doing that, do levels two and three. That, for me, is the ideal um, sort of runway, which kind of means that you qualify around the same time that you put that four years of professional experience together, which you need to get the CFA designation. So passing the exams is one thing, but you also need that four years of professional education. And so if you do it in the way that I've described, those things can be pretty much coterminous at the end of the day. So you pass level three, and then hopefully you can apply for your charter uh, immediately thereafter. And so the average CFA newly minted charter holder is somewhere between 28 and 31 years of age. That's kind of where we pitch it. And the curriculum is pitched for people of that vintage. It's not a PhD in investment management. Um, it's a foundations, really, in investment management. It's that everything that you need to know in your first four or five years as a fund manager, as an investment manager. What you then do with it, so it's a bit like, again, having that medical degree. A, a, a medical degree doesn't make you a good um, surgeon or a, a great obstetrician uh, or anything of that nature. It gives you the foundation that you need to then build your career on top of that. And so that's what the charter is, is all about. Um, so uh, we've got lots of study tools. Um, 300 hours a level, as I say. Uh, average completion time is four years. Um, and please remember, this is a sort of a study hint. We're not trying to catch you out in the curriculum. It's English language, yes, but don't read between the lines or anything like that. Don't think we're trying to trick you with language or anything like that. It's not true. We work very hard because most of our students, English is not their first language. I know that's not, not necessarily the case here in Kenya, but English is not necessarily their first language, so we don't make in the, the mastery of English language, the key. It's the knowledge that's absolutely important. And don't read between the lines in the questions. Don't listen to anybody who tells you that CFA test this, that, or the other. We only test what's in the curriculum and what are in the learning outcome statements in that curriculum. We never test anything else. So if you read the curriculum, focus on the learning outcome statements, do practice exams, you will pass this exam. I like to say that I'm living evidence that the CFA is not difficult. If it was, I would never have passed it. I can promise you that. What it is, what it is, is an awful lot of work. And that's really the secret to the CFA. If you do the work, you will pass the exam. Not, there's not one person in this room that doesn't have the intellectual smarts to nail this. I absolutely promise you. It's just, uh, it's just hard labor. 
And that's, that's, the, that's the key to it. So don't, don't undersell yourself. Don't think there are shortcuts uh, to get through it. Some of the global names. Um, I know Standard Charter Bank is, is big in, uh, well, Stanvik is uh, uh, as well, a big here in, uh, in uh, Kenya. Uh, those are certainly key employers, but the largest employers worldwide, as you kind of would expect, are the, the global majors um, there. And also, increasingly, uh, the big four accounting firms. Big four accounting firms are more and more drawn into um, uh, asset consulting, uh, valuations work, uh, all sorts of things of that nature. So you'll find that PricewaterhouseCoopers, Deloitte, KPMG, Ernst & Young are uh, employing more and more charter holders uh, for those reasons as well. So, so look as well not just to the traditional sources of employment, but there are uh, other places that you can go where your charter will be extremely valuable to you. That's my point about member value. Uh, here in East Africa today, we have about 107 charter holders uh, and about 1,000 candidates. Uh, we recognize that today, here in Kenya, we only offer a June test center. So if you're a level one candidate and you want to sit it in December, you have to go outside of the country. We fully recognize that that is expensive, stressful, and time consuming. And we need to do something about that. And I'm very fond of making promises on Gary's behalf uh, for who, uh, who has to execute that promise. But uh, I do promise you that we will work very diligently to try and get you a test center here uh, for December uh, in Nairobi so you're not put through that, um, that pain. I, I didn't actually make a promise there, but I love the, I love the applause, so keep it coming. That's, that's a, um, the other thing that we do on that slide, if you remember the three buckets, which was uh, develop uh, future professionals, then the member value side, uh, and this is the third piece, which is really what we call advocacy. It's working with financial regulators everywhere to develop um, policy initiatives that really support the market globally. So that's working with the Capital Markets Authority here tonight, uh, with the Pension Authority, uh, with others, uh, central banks, who are interested in developing and raising standards, but also making sure that the capital market extends in terms of products and uh, um, uh, uh, other types of uh, initiative so that uh, Kenya uh, mobilizes uh, international money as well as domestic money to meet all those needs going forward. So again, one of the great volunteering opportunities, and we've, we've heard so much about that in the day that we have spent here in Nairobi, one of the great volunteering opportunities is if advocacy, what we call advocacy, appeals to you, that's the best way to get involved with your society. There is so much happening, so much positive happening in the capital markets infrastructure here in Nairobi that the Institute, as a neutral professional body, we're not an industry lobbyist, we're not there lobbying away for the participants in the industry. What we're trying to do with our advocacy is to promote a capital market that really serves investors' needs. So it's a very altruistic activity, and we'd urge you to, to take part in that if that's of interest to you. So I'm going to end it out there and hand it on. Uh, if there are any questions that we can deal with whilst we're still here, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, or uh, Eleanor and Patricia have our email addresses and just uh, ping us a note and we'll get straight back to you. Thank you for listening. It's, um, it's wonderful um, uh, to welcome you into the CFA family. I hope many of you will be inspired by today to uh, come join us on this journey. Uh, Kenya needs financial talent. Uh, the country needs to mobilize its resources and international resources to cure some of the problems that you have here so that we can develop Kenya to really meet the financial aspirations of all Kenyans. Thank you very much.